Another aspect of image-guided intervention that, that we're, we're doing a lot of in veterinary medicine is uh, placement of uh, urethral stents for malignant urethral obstruction. And malignant urethral obstruction uh, most often happens due to transitional cell carcinoma or prostatic carcinoma. Um, these both tend to involve the uh, uh, bladder, neck, and proximal urethra, prostatic urethra, and male dogs. And uh, traditionally, um, those, those tumors, the majority of the time, are not obstructive. Most of them uh, cause infiltration of the bladder wall and signs of urinary tract disease. In about 10 to 15 percent of the population, they develop actual urethral obstruction secondary to the tumor. And that patient population, um, there's very few options available. In the past, what we did in those patients was uh, we we've sent them for, we placed a, a catheter um, just to divert the urine on a short-term basis. Um, however, that's obviously only a temporary fix. So in the past, we were forced to place a surgical cystostomy tube, so a tube uh, through the abdominal wall into the, uh, into the bladder. The owner would then empty the bladder three to four times a day, and um, those tubes work. You know, that's a good thing about them is they work. However, um, most owners find that aesthetically displeasing. Infection, especially recurrent urinary tract infections, are a risk, and patient removal of the tube is, is also a potential risk. So although the tube works well, um, they are a little bit invasive to place, and they do have some complications associated with them, but they work. Um, so as, uh, as interventional radiology developed, um, a, uh, uh, the, the father of interventional radiology is, is Chick Weiss, who was at the University of Pennsylvania, and he, he and his colleagues um, developed a, a technique for urethral stent placement. So um, stenting uh, you know, opens the closed. It, uh, it's very similar to what would be put in a coronary artery of a human with coronary artery disease and obstruction of the coronary artery. Um, so its stent is uh, it's a uh, metallic tube essentially that's delivered via catheter and it's expanded in the area of the obstruction to push the obstruction out of the way. It doesn't treat the tumor specifically, but it, it, uh, it moves the tumor out of the way, allowing the animal to, to urinate again. So uh, the technique that we use is to, uh, to uh, always stabilize the patient with, ure with urethral obstruction. If they're hyperkalemic and azotemic, we have to obviously deal with those problems first. We place a urinary catheter, fluid diuresis, get them completely stabilized, make the diagnosis that it indeed is malignant urethral obstruction. We don't want to stent a, uh, a non-malignant uh, cause of, of urinary tract obstruction. Um, so diagnose the problem. Uh, one particular thing we always want to do is, because these tumors tend to grow up into the bladder neck, they can also cause ure ureteral obstruction. Um, and so we, we definitely see a population of dogs that have both urethral obstruction and ureteral obstruction. If we relieve the urethral obstruction, that's easy, but um, if they, uh, if they, you know, if their kidneys can't drain appropriately into their bladder, they're going to go into renal failure and have a, a poor outcome. So we always want to uh, get a good ultrasound, make sure the ureters aren't dilated, make sure the kidneys aren't dilated, um, and then uh, once we're confident in our diagnosis um, and the owner is uh, is uh, on board for uh, doing some kind of intervention to relieve the obstruction. Then, uh, then we uh, we move forward. Generally, the discussion I always have with the clients beforehand is that uh, dogs with um, urethral stents. You know, we should we discuss the pros and cons. I should say of uh, cystostomy tube versus urethral stent. Um, and I already mentioned the, the pros and cons of the cystostomy tube. But with the urethral stent, uh, the pros are that it's placed non-invasively. It's placed via the urethra, so there's no incisions, no surgery, and uh, very little, I would say, or no pain. Generally, these patients aren't on pain medications for the stent placement. They may be on pain medications for their cancer. Um, and uh, so it's not completely non-invasive. Um, it's quick. It's technically not very challenging, um, which is which is uh, nice as well. Um, and everything's internalized. There's no uh, external device that the owner has to manage. So uh, that's desirable as well. Probably the biggest complication of urethral stent placement is the, uh, the potential for creating incontinence. Um, and incontinence happens in about 25% of cases. Uh, and I would say very mild incontinence happens in another 25%. So 25% are completely incontinent, random dribbling of urine, and the owner has to be 
accepting of that. Um, the other 25% that may dribble a little bit right before, right after urination, generally not a management problem. And the vast majority uh, do remain continent. And uh, we don't have a good way to predict who will be continent and who will be incontinent um, before stent placement. So the owner has to accept that risk. And once they accept that risk, then, um, or if they accept that risk, then we move down the road of doing a urethral stent. If they won't accept that risk, then we have a, a situation where um, cystostomy tube is probably the best option for that for that client. So uh, the patient's anesthetized. Um, the first thing we do is a retrograde urethrogram, so a contrast study. Um, and I, in a male dog, we just place our catheter in the tip of the penis um, and then inject, uh, inject under pressure to distend the urethra and show us exactly where the, uh, the obstruction is. We want to know the length of the obstruction and we want to know the, the width of the normal urethra adjacent to the tumor. Um, from that, we're able to calculate the size of the stent that we need um, and the length of the stent that we need. And we usually try and pick a stent that's going to span the tumor a little bit on each side. So as that tumor grows, which it's going to do eventually, as that tumor grows, um, the stent will hopefully uh, uh, still be able to maintain the patency of the urethra. So once we know the location and the width of the obstruction, then we place the stent at the, uh, uh, across the obstruction. Um, it's a uh, self-expanding stent. Um, it's made of uh, nickel titanium alloy called nitinol. And uh, uh, the stent's deployed off the catheter. Um, it pushes the tumor out of the way. It has a lot of outward radial force, so even a very tight obstruction will open up with the stent. Um, and, uh, and generally, then we, we confirm that the urethra is patent with a repeat urethrogram. Uh, we express them and make sure they, they can void appropriately. Um, and then they're, they're head to recovery. Um, the whole procedure, you know, 30 minutes to an hour, I would say, is most common. Um, and when they, as soon as they recover, uh, we're, we're watching them very closely for about the first 12 hours. Goal is to characterize, are they straining or not? Um, do they have a good urine stream or not? Which we expect them to have, obviously. Um, and then the, the biggest one is, uh, is there any evidence of incontinence or not? Um, for the animals that are incontinent, sometimes phenylpropanolamine therapy uh, will, will minimize it a little bit more, but generally uh, if they're incontinent, they're, they're going to be incontinent. Um, Long-term outcome, uh, most of these dogs, rather than dying of urethral obstruction, um, that, that problem is palliated. Um, and so then uh, therapy can direct, be directed towards the tumor itself. Um, and most of these patients go on to, to, uh, to, to die in the future from um, the spread of their cancer. But often chemotherapy, radiation therapy, um, there's been a lot of good advancements there that, uh, that are allowing these dogs, I think, to live longer and longer with good quality of life. So for the clients, you know, they presented because their dog couldn't urinate. Um, and and, uh, and that, that was going to force them into a euthanasia decision a lot of the time. And so now with uh, you know, with these options available to us, you know, within 24 hours, we can have that problem totally relieved, and their dog is back to um, the same dog that they had before. They know it's got cancer, um, but uh, the the acute, you know, emergency presentation for that that problem is is handled, um, and now they can they can focus on treating the tumor. Or, you know, so a lot of owners don't like to do radiation, don't like to do chemotherapy, and that's fine. They can they still bought themselves more good quality time with their dog. Um, Long-term outcome in these dogs, uh, about 10% either have ingrowth of tumor through the stent or overgrowth of tumor over the ends of the stent. That's usually only in about 10% of them. So uh, we feel like it's a, a, a good procedure um, that, that gives these, these clients some options. Um, I know there's people placing these stents uh, using digital radiography. It's a lot more challenging than fluoroscopy because um, fluoroscopy will give you continuous, uh, continuous uh, imaging, I guess. Um, but uh, you know, like tracheal stents, um, some of them are being done with uh, digital radiography and that's, that's nice as well.